grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are to week three out of three, looking at one of Christ's trickiest metaphors to understand when he described himself to the people as the bread of life. I don't think I'm overstating things when I say that Jesus as the bread of life has been one of the biggest sticking points and dividing points in Christian theology for the last, well, 2,000 years. Understanding how it is that God gives himself to us through Jesus' flesh has been the point of many, many debates. But before we get to that discussion, let's review about how we got here. Does anybody remember, especially if you've been here the last couple of weeks, when Jesus addresses the crowds in John chapter 6, the portion that we're looking at today, what just happened the evening before? What had he just done for this same crowd? Do you remember? He had just fed them. Small crowd, right? 12 or 15, the sort of, you know, scrape together what's the leftovers in the, in the dinner, in the, in the fridge, and you can put it together. Is that the story? 5,000 men are specified, which means it's unspecified how many women and children were there. We know at least a minimum of 5,000 people were fed with five loaves and two fish, essentially one person's lunch. I would love to go back and watch the videotape of how that happened. I have no idea. What I do know is that Jesus had performed a miracle the likes of which most of us are probably unlikely to see within our lifetime. And then he followed it up like any good performer, right? Though he wasn't just performing. He did another incredible work overnight. What was that? He walked on water. That's right, the disciples left in a boat. There were no boats left. And then there he is walking on the land. The crowd catches up with him the next day, says, wait a minute, when did you come here? And right away, Jesus gives their first curveball. This is a conversation full of curveballs. It's part of why I'm glad we've got three weeks to try to kind of pull it apart here. Because he says, I think they've asked a legitimate question. He doesn't answer it. Instead of saying, well, you know, I walked on water. He says, you are only here. Not because you saw signs and miracles and had your faith life strengthened. You're following the chuck wagon. I gave you dinner last night, and now you want more food. And they say, well, it's only fair, you know, God fed our forefathers in the wilderness. And Jesus said, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. And once again, they have a legitimate beef, to mix metaphors there. They have a legitimate gripe. And that is, how can you say that you came down from heaven? We know who your parents were. In fact, Jesus, we know what their marital status was when you were conceived. All right? How can you claim to be coming to us from heaven? Again, probably a legitimate question, but one to which he throws another curveball. He says, the bread that I will give is my flesh. Now, at this point, I think we can all agree, things have gotten weird. The idea that they are supposed to dine on his body, I can understand why they have some questions, and that's where we pick up today. Jesus says to them, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This sends up a few red flags in their own mind. There's a reason, you probably already knew this, there is a reason that the early Christians in the Roman Empire were called cannibals. They met... The only place they could meet without fear of, uh, of being trapped or, or captured in the catacombs, which were essentially tombs. And then they teach that they're eating Jesus' body and blood. Yeah, I'd be a little weirded out too by that whole idea, this cult that meets in tombs and drinks blood and eats flesh. And right away, the, the, the Jews that are there, they've got a question. Again, I think a legitimate one. How can this man give us his flesh to eat. And it's this question that has then been dividing the church ever since. How can Jesus give us his flesh to eat? But I want you to notice something. This marks the third time in as many paragraphs, roughly, that they ask what I consider a legitimate question, and Jesus does not 
Answer it. He does not explain how he's going to give us his flesh. Instead, as he has done every single point along the way, as he continues to do in our lives, rather than answer the question and tell us what we want to know, Jesus tells us what we need to hear. Jesus does not go into what I and many others who have studied theology wish that he would, which is about three to four paragraphs, if not chapters, of explanation of exactly how it is that he intends to give his body to us, his flesh to eat, in order to give us eternal life. He does not answer the question of how. He instead answers the question, why? Take a look just at some excerpts here from verses 53 to 59. Jesus says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Skipping to 56, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks in my blood abides in me, and I in him. Skipping to the second half of 57, Whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Skipping to the end of 58, Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Did he answer how? Not at all. What he hammered home by my count, about six or seven times, is why. Why Jesus is giving us his flesh to eat. Unless you eat it, you have no life in you. If you eat it, you have eternal life, and he will raise you up. If you eat it, you abide in him, and he in you. If you eat it, you will live because of him. If you eat it, you will live forever. It's what he means when he says he is giving the bread of life, the bread that gives life, the bread that sustains life, the bread that redeems life, the bread that reclaims life. Now, at this point, many of you may have the same objection that I have. That's all awesome, Jesus. Love it. Not the question I asked. Could we please go back? We're entering what seems like, I mean, it feels like we've been in one forever, but an election cycle, right? So we have before us about 14 months of people not quite answering the question that they've been asked. That frustrates me, and it frustrates me even here. They ask how. It's a legitimate question. Jesus doesn't answer it. Instead, six or seven times, he hammers home. Why? But actually, if you think about it, this is not such a leap. Raise your hand. A lot of times I say, I'm not going to have you do this. We're going to do it as a mental exercise. It's actually a physical exercise this time. Raise your hand if you ever take aspirin. All right. Wait, wait, wait. Keep them up. I'm going to tell you to put them down. This is like Simon says. All right. Now, put them down if you do not know how aspirin works. You just take it anyway. All right, we have one or two hands still up of people who take aspirin knowing how it works. So what about the rest of us? We don't know how it works, but we know that it works. And when the headache starts or the joint pain or whatever drives us to the aspirin bottle, we open it up and we swallow it. All right, raise your hand if you drive a car that primarily uses unleaded fuel. Keep your hand up if you can explain to me how a catalytic converter works. <laughs> Once again, well, all right, a couple of hands. I thought there might be a couple. Gary, you didn't keep your hand up. You know, I drive diesel. You drive diesel. That's right. Okay, fair enough. All right. Once again, we reap the benefits without fully understanding how. Jesus knows far more important than us being able to give some sort of physical or chemical disquisition on how it is that he's going to give us his flesh, is that we know why he's giving his flesh. And if we know why he's giving his flesh, we're not really going to care a whole lot about how. But the disciples still are wrestling with this, and I understand that. Verse 60, they say what I feel. 
And I love the disciples because most of the time they do. I mean, it's easy for us to rag on them and say, well, he gave them the answer. When we have 2,000 years more experience and the gift of the Holy Spirit already living in us, so let's not be too hard on those disciples. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And what they mean there, and I don't particularly like that translation, it doesn't just mean listen to, it means like to understand, to know what he means. This is a hard understand, a hard saying. Who can understand it is probably the way I would translate this. And I agree with them. That we are supposed to eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood. Does anybody disagree that's a hard saying? Does anybody disagree that it's very difficult to understand? That's why Jesus focuses instead on the why. The why we receive his blood. We may not, in fact, I would go so far as to say that we cannot ever fully understand this. This is described elsewhere in scripture as one of the mysteries of God. And if you know my background, you know I didn't grow up Lutheran, I grew up a lot of other things. One of the things that I love about Lutheran theology is how it carefully preserves those mysteries. Jesus says, of this meal that we're going to partake of, he says, when you receive this bread and wine, you're receiving my body and blood, and at that point, the Lutherans place a full stop. We don't need to explain how. Every explanation of how, I think, has taken away from our proper understanding of why. And that's where Jesus placed his emphasis. We don't have to understand how aspirin works to benefit from it. We don't have to understand how a catalytic converter works to benefit from it. We don't have to understand how Jesus gives us his flesh and blood in order to benefit from it. And that is good news because I don't think we ever are going to plumb all the way to the depths of that particular mystery. And Jesus says in verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Looking elsewhere in Scripture, Paul says in his letters to the Corinthians, no one can say Jesus is Lord except the Spirit speaking through him. He says elsewhere, what do you have that you did not receive the way that you would receive a gift? And in the Old Testament, God makes it quite plain through the prophet Isaiah, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so far are my ways above yours. Frankly, I've, t I've quoted this before, you know, uh, Groucho Marx's famous line, I wouldn't want to be part of a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> I wouldn't want to worship and serve a God that I can fully grasp and understand. Because that would mean that me, with my flawed and finite mind, I'm still greater than that which I am worshipping. That's always held appeal throughout history. I think that's why idols have always held such appeal. We can understand the way an idol is supposed to work. I give you this, you give me that. If you don't, I chuck you out and I carve a new one. Right? And that's what we do with our human nature. We might not put them on our shelf in the form of, you know, a little Buddha or that sort of thing. Instead, we might put them on our shelf in the form of an award. Or we might put them on our shelf in the form of a photo of our large and beautiful family. We might put it on our shelf in any number of different ways. We might put it in our file cabinet in the form of our retirement plan and our security there. Anything we place our trust in, that is truly our God. And we continue, as John Calvin said, the human heart is an idol factory. We're real good at making idols other than God because we want something we can explain. We want something we can control. And when you grasp on to Christ, or when he gives himself to you, more properly said, you got more than you can chew on. Except you don't. You can chew it. You can swallow it. Somehow, through mysteries we cannot fully expound on, he gives us his own flesh. And why does he do it? That's the point he wants to make sure that you know. Because his flesh is life. Those who eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, you will live forever, for he will raise you up on the last day. Think of it as like an organ transplant. Why does someone get an organ transplant? Because the organ that they have is not functioning, and if left in place, it will result in their death. And so instead, they're given someone else's, an organ that they did not grow and have not cared for. But in order for that to happen, what has to take place? 
the donor has to, has to die. That's what Jesus did for us. We needed a complete flesh transplant. Our flesh was so infected and so marred and stained by sin that we could do nothing but die under its condemnation. Except that Jesus came took that condemnation on his own perfect flesh, which was not marred by sin, so that he could give to us that same flesh, that his flesh becomes our flesh. I have no idea how the physics or chemistry of that work, and to some degree, I don't care. The same way I'm not going to read about how aspirin works before I swallow the pills. I don't need to know in order to receive the incredible benefits that it gives. Now, to those of you that it still gets under your skin from time to time, and you can count me among you, that we can't give a perfect and full explanation to this mystery, you don't have a choice. And sometimes when you don't have a choice, that makes decision making a lot easier, doesn't it? When you only have one option, it's not hard to know which option to exercise. Many of the disciples were troubled by this teaching, some to the degree that they decided, you know what, I'm going to close the chapter on this particular stage of my life. Jesus turns to the twelve and he says, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter says, and there are words that we sing during the Alleluia of one of our divine service settings, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we've believed and have come to know that you're the Holy One of God. They don't have any other options. Classic seminary joke is if you want to be able to fail a whole class, say define God and give two examples. Doesn't work that way. There are no two examples of God. So when the twelve knew that Jesus was indeed God, they knew that they had no other option but to follow him through thick or thin. When the teaching was nice about the flowers, right, and the birds, when we like the teaching, we follow him. When the teaching's about drinking his blood and eating his flesh, we may not like that quite so much, we still follow him. We don't have any other choice. He is the one who has the words of eternal life. But within that limited array of options, Jesus or nothing else, comes our incredible certainty, our incredible strength. You see, God does the work. We just reap the benefits. We're the beneficiaries. He does the heavy lifting. He dies, we live. He gives his flesh unto sin and death and defeat so that by taking his flesh and his blood into ours, we have forgiveness of sins and life and salvation. I don't know exactly how he does it. I never will. I'm happy to keep studying it, keep wrestling with it for the rest of my life, even knowing that I'll never have a perfect and glib answer for the question. And I'm all right with that. And if you believe the words that you sang before the sermon, then you are too, because you sang with me these words. My heart has now become thy dwelling, O blessed Holy Trinity. With angels I, thy praises telling, shall live in joy eternally. Lord, may thy body and thy blood be for my soul the highest good. There can be no better gift than that which Christ gives when he gives himself, no matter the circumstances. Do we understand it perfectly and fully? No. Do we need to? No. Thanks be to God, we're saved by grace, not our understanding of it. And God gives himself to us. Each time that we receive his word, each time that we receive his body and blood for our renewal. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in this faith. In your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.